crazy clock is moving fast, so I'm going to talk fast. Um, you will find your way to 1 Samuel 29. 1 Samuel chapter 29. We're going to look today at um, chapter 29 and chapter 30. In- inseparable. So we're going to look at those together. As you're finding your way there, what we've been seeing are two very different men in two very different messes. And both of them are messes of their own making. Last week we saw the low point of Saul's low life, if I could put it that way. But I'd call us back to David's life in the previous chapter. God had clearly and repeatedly told David that David was going to be king and that God knew how to deal with Saul. God had clearly and repeatedly shown David that he was with him through amazing circumstance after circumstance. And yet, if you remember, David fled for fear of his life to the Philistines, the enemies of God's people. And there he he lied about his loyalties. He lied about his raiding. And the result was he went out and butchered men and women. And now he's stuck going into battle with the Philistines against his people Israel, whom he loves. Lying gets you into a mess. Amen? But last week with Saul, we learned that real trouble isn't found just in circumstances. It's found in facing circumstances alone without God. Saul has real trouble. But today I want us to see the difference that the presence of the Lord makes even in our messes. Let's read chapter 29, if you will, and if you're able, please stand as we read. Then the Philistines gathered together all their armies at Aphek, and the Israelites encamped by a fountain which is in Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines passed in review by hundreds and by thousands, but David and his men passed in review at the rear with Achish. Then the princes of the Philistines said, I'm I'm inserting here, wait a minute. What are these Hebrews doing here? And Achish said to the princes of the Philistines, is this not David, the servant of Saul, king of Israel, who has been with me these days or these years? And to this day I have found no fault in him since he defected to me. But the princes of the Philistines were angry with him. So the princes of the Philistines said to him, Make this fellow return, that he may go back to the place which you have appointed for him. And do not let him go down with us in battle, lest in the battle he become our adversary. For with what could he reconcile himself to his master, if not with the heads of these men? Is this not David, of whom they sang to one another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David... His tens of thousands? Then Achish said to David, called David and said to him, Surely as the Lord lives. By the way, that's a Philistine Lord calling God Yahweh. Surely as Yahweh lives, you have been upright and you're going out and you're coming in with me in the army is good in my sight. For to this day, I have not found evil in you since the day of your coming to me. Nevertheless, the lords do not favor you. Therefore, return now and go in peace that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines. So David said to Achish, but what have I done? And to this day, what have you found in your servant as long as I have been with you that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my Lord, the king? Then Achish answered and said to David, I know that you are as good in my sight as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the princes of the Philistines have said he shall not go with us to the battle. Now, therefore, arise in the morning with your master servants who have come with you. And as soon as you are up early in the morning and have light, depart. So David and his men rose early to depart in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, attacked Ziklag, and burned it with fire. 
and had taken captive the women and those who were uh, there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So this is every woman that was married to one of David's men. It was David's wives, which I hate to make plural. It was their kids. So David and his men came to the city and there it was burned with fire and their wives, their sons, their daughters had been taken captive. And David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of Yahweh saying, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. So David went, he and his 600 men who were with him, and came to the brook Basor, where they stayed, who, where those stayed who were left behind. But David pursued, and he and 400 men for 200 stayed behind, who were so weary that they could not cross the brook Besor. Then they found an Egyptian in the field. They brought him to David and they gave him bread and he ate and they let him drink water and they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. So when he had eaten, his strength came back to him for he had eaten no bread nor drunk water for three days and three nights. Then David said to him, to whom do you belong and where are you from? And he said, I'm a young man from Egypt, a servant of an Amalekite. And my master left me behind because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion of the southern area of the Cherethites in the territory which belongs to Judah and of the southern area of Caleb. And we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, can you take me down to this troop? So he said, swear to me by God or by the gods that you will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hand of my master and I will take you down to this troop. And when he had brought him down, there they were spread out all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoils or anything which they had taken from them. David recovered all. Then David took all the flocks and the herds they had driven before those other livestock and said, this is David's spoil. Now David came to the 200 men who had been so weary they could not follow David, whom they had also made to stay at the brook Basor. So they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless men of those who went with David. Remember, these were kind of a motley crew. All the wicked and worthless men of those who went with David answered and said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except for every man's wife and children, that they may lead them away and depart. But David said, my brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given us, who has preserved us and delivered us, delivered into our hand the troop that came against us. For who will heed you in this matter? But as, his, but as his part is who goes down to the battle, so shall his part be who stays by the supplies. They shall share alike. And so it was from that day forward, he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel to this day. Now when David came to Ziklag, he sent some of the spoils to the elders of Judah, to his friends saying, here is a present for you from the spoils of the enemies of the Lord, to those who were in Bethel, to those who were in Ramoth in the south, those who were of Jatir, those who were of Aror, those who were of Sifmoth, those who were of Eshtemoa, those who were in Rachel, those who were in the cities of the Jeremelites, those who were in the cities of the Kenites, those who were in Hormah, those who were in Choroshan, those who were in Atah. 
those who were in Hebron, and to all the places where David himself and his men were accustomed to rove. Thank you for standing a while. Let me pray, and we will consider this. You can be seated. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the things that you teach us about you in this. It's easy to get lost in the details and feel like we're just reading a story for entertainment and maybe that it's lacking. But Lord, this is an entertainment. This is the precious, precious word of God revealing you to us. Help us to think about what it is you want us to see. In Jesus' name, amen. What difference does the presence of the Lord make? Again, David's in a mess of his own making, just as Saul is in a mess of his own making. But David has a right relationship with God, and it makes all the difference in the world. First of all, we see that David is delivered from himself. I like, like Tom's uh, thumbnail up there. Delivered from myself. And David is surely, surely that in two ways. He's delivered from himself in regards to what he's done with the Philistines. Uh, this first chapter of uh, 29 here is a simple scene and in a sense is comical. David and his men have presented themselves, uh, I imagine, with a belly full of antacids if they had those then. A lot of empty Tums bottles cast out into the desert as they're walking. They're going to present themselves to the enemies to go fight with them. And you remember David's been lying and saying he's been attacking the enemies of the Philistines, but really, I'm sorry, he's been saying he's been attacking Israel to win favor with the Philistines, but really he's been attacking uh, Israel's friends, um, the Philistines' friends. He's been lying and butchering people. Uh, all the troops are here inspected at the Philistines and, and the, the Philistine lords are stunned with Achish, a Philistine king. What the, what the heck are you doing bringing a, uh, uh, an Israelite to go fight the Israelites? And really highlights how naive Achish was. It also highlights what a deceiver David has become. David has fooled Achish to think that he is with him. And to make it worse, Achish is still vouching for, for David. To the Philistine lords, he's saying, he's my mercenary. He's never let me down. He's been killing Israelis this whole time. Is that true? No. Achish has been lied to by David. But the lords of the Philistines counter that with really two good arguments. They, they counter it with a logical argument. Achish he might turn on us in battle. If he wants to get right with his people again, what better way than for him to go into battle with us and in the midst of the battle turn on us and start destroying us? This makes no logical sense, Achish. He can't go. And then they, they also have a good argument from history. Achish, don't you remember his song? I want I tell you, that old song. Saul has slain thousands. This, this David, the one you're bringing, he's slain tens of thousands. Of who? Philistines. Are you kidding me? Achish is outnumbered among the Philistine lords. He's frankly out IQ'd uh, by the Philistine lords. And, and yet Achish is out, outraged. How can they do this to David? He's been so good to me. Verse 6, he brings news back to David at the rear of the flanks. He says, I, I'm, I'm so sorry, but they won't, they won't let you go. And I'm thinking if I'm David, I'm going to go, oh, man. That's, oh. Make a little face, make a little fuss, and then walk away and go, yes. But boy, David, David really throws it on here. He, um, look at verse 8, verse, chapter 29, verse 8. David said to Achish, what have I done? And to this day, haven't you found in your servant, have you found anything with me as long as I've been with you that I can't go out and fight against the enemies of my Lord, the King? What have I done? I Man, he's throwing it on thick here. A well-practiced deceiver performing his art, right? We're supposed to see that, and to me it's a little bit humorous, but it's supposed to, we're supposed to look at that and go, David, what are you doing? It's supposed to be sad to us. Here is God's man, right? David, the man after God's own heart. And he is 
growing better and better at living the devil's way. Remember, it is Satan who is the father of lies and deceit. And that's who David is imitating. God's people are to be people that the New Testament teaches us. God's people are to be people whose yes is yes and whose no is no. Simple integrity is what we are saved to and called to. Uh, great David's far greater son, his name is what? Great David's greater son is Jesus. Never lose sight of that in the Old Testament. When you're watching the lineage of David, you're watching the lineage of the Messiah. Great David's greater son would later say this, anything more than a yes and a no is of the evil one. And yet here David is lying and deceiving almost at a professional level. It's just a good reminder here to us. If, if your present course right now is a course that leads you, pushes you, edges you to lie, you're on the wrong course. Christians aren't exempt from being on a lying course. David is the example of that. Get off that course. There's a good day today to say, God, I'm going in the wrong direction and my behavior shows it to me. I need you for strength to turn around. But the point of all points here is that God delivers David from his own mess. And we've been here before, we've seen this before, and we've learned some of these lessons before, but we see it again. It's a great reminder. Number one, God's providence, God's way of providing is most often silent. There's no mention or acknowledgement of God in this chapter by name. Angels aren't circling above David's head as he presents himself to the Philistine lords. There aren't tongues being spoken and interpreted over this. God is just silently delivering David. Don't get frustrated when you don't see amazing things of God. God most often works silently around you. But when you, when you get a glimpse of what he's doing, sorry, David, the Philistine lords won't let you go. Be encouraged. Be reminded that God is faithful. God's providence is often silent. There's a great peace in that truth. God knows how to take care of me. The other thing we learn here again is that God's providence, His way of providing for you is limitless. Aren't you glad God's not bound? God uses pagan Philistines here to accomplish His purpose. David has not been walking well enough to keep him out of a mess. He's put himself in a mess by walking faithlessly. But God is able to use even pagan Philistines to accomplish his will. He can use righteous people or unrighteous people to accomplish His will. We, we read Saturday morning uh, men's group. If you're, a, if you're a guy, I'd highly recommend you come Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. Um, we read yesterday, Dave taught and taught us about Balaam. Um, Balaam, we, we know of as a prophet of God, but he wasn't, he wasn't a righteous prophet. He was a sorcerer. He was a pagan. He was not a good man. Matter of fact, we've learned recently sorcery uh, and divination is an abomination to God. And yet God spoke to this sorcering prophet and he revealed things to help Israel. And God even used that unrighteous man to do that. What else did God use in, in numbers there in the story of Balaam? Unusual thing that God used to accomplish his purpose. He used a donkey. There's a reason that's in the story there. There's a reason that's in God's workings in this world. Same lesson we just learned. God is limitless in his provision. He used a donkey who talked miraculously from the Lord. It's amazing that this donkey was obedient to God 
Wherever the angel of the Lord went, the, the, the donkey said, okay, whatever you're doing. When he got hemmed in, the donkey said, okay, I'll just sit down. And, and Balaam is doing what? He's beating the donkey. He's smiting the donkey. He kept saying over and over again. Donkey finally looks at him and said, what have I done? <laughs> Love it. God can use righteous people. God can use unrighteous people. God can use donkeys. God can use righteous behavior to accomplish His purpose. God can use unrighteous behavior to accomplish His purpose. God, God sent the Assyrians to uh, attack Israel, His people, to punish them. To open their eyes to their wickedness. And He said it. He said, Assyria is a rod in my hand. I will send them. I will cry out to them and call them in. But He says this, they're coming to do judgment against my people for my purposes, but they don't know that's what they're doing. They're just coming because they're greedy. God can use anything to accomplish His purpose. Even the New Testament, He can use what He calls, Jesus calls, sons of the devil from among both the Jews and the Gentiles to murder the only righteous man who's ever lived on the face of the earth, the Messiah. God used their wickedness to accomplish my salvation, your salvation. Again, there's peace in getting our mind and our heart around that. God will accomplish His purpose, period. And here in this passage, His purpose is to spare David's life and to establish him as the king of Israel. And listen, to spare David's life so that David can have a son and who can have a son and who can have a son and a son and a son and a daughter who will bear the seed of God in Messiah. And when you ever get to those lists in Matthew where it says, and so and so begotten, 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 and then you go, wow, that's useless. Oh, there's nothing in God's word that's useless. It's showing you that God was working in this moment for Mary, for Jesus, for your salvation and mine, and for Stephen Pusley's salvation. Praise the Lord. God will accomplish His purposes, period. By the way, Jesus is coming back. Did you know that? And the world's getting rotten. Did you know that? And the Bible says He's able to use every single thing. Righteous people, unrighteous people. Righteous acts, unrighteous acts. To accomplish His purposes. To bring Jesus back for His church. The Bible says He is coming, but He is not coming without there being a great falling away. A great apostasy among believers. Professing believers. There are no believers who are going to fall away. There are many professing believers who are going to fall away. And God says it's going to happen. The reason I'm pointing that out to me and to you, reminding us of that is... Don't get rocked off your gourd. I don't know if that's a good illustration or not, but it sounded good in my brain before it came out of my... Don't get rocked off your gourd when things start happening. People start falling away from faith in Christ. Is it happening around us? Yes, it is. Don't get knocked off course by that. Why? Why would I not get knocked off course by what is unrighteous and wrong and hurtful? Because God's going to accomplish His purpose. That's why. The Bible says Jesus is going to come, but He's going to come through a messy process. That there's going to be a great man, maybe the greatest man who's lived since Jesus. And He's going to make great peace and make great promises. And He's going to do great signs and great wonders. And He is a great liar. And He will become the greatest Antichrist who ever has been. And don't get knocked off course, Christian. Because God will accomplish His purpose. Interesting side note. I just say that as an application. We need to remember God's purposes that are yet before us. An interesting side note here. You remember last week, the last thing we saw of Saul was Saul walked away from a witch and from a last meal and he walked away into the 
darkness. Do you remember that? And we, we talked about how that connected with Judas, who also walked away from a last meal into the darkness, and how Saul and Judas both uh, grieved but didn't repent. And how Saul and Judas both walked away into the darkness after a last meal. And, and both Saul and Judas would kill themselves. We see this correlation. There's such an interesting picture here in verse 11 of chapter 29. Actually, verse 10, if you'll back up there. Now, therefore, Achish says to David, rise early in the what? In the morning with your master servants when, who have come with you. And as soon as you are up early in the morning and you have what? Light. Depart. And so verse 11, it says here that David and his men rose early to depart in the morning. And that's a contrast that's intentional. Saul walks without God into the darkness after his mess. David, after his mess, because he has a relationship with God, walks into the light. And that picture of light and darkness is going to continue with power through the New Testament. And I would just encourage you, if you don't know what book to start reading on Monday morning, start reading John's Gospel. And you start, just watch Light and Dark, and it'll be the most amazing thing. The Spirit of God will teach you things about Him. David walks away into the light. Such a beautiful picture. You may be in a, in a mess. And you may be even in a mess of your own making, and it's dark. Do you have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus? If you don't, you're like Saul. Oh my goodness, I wouldn't be in your shoes for anything. But there's hope for you. His name's Jesus and you can come today. But are you in a mess and maybe even a mess of your own making and it's dark, but you have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus, His Son? God knows how to get you from this darkness you put yourself in, delivered from yourself, and He knows how to get you back to the light, back to the path. I'm not talking about loss of salvation. I'm talking about the path of your walk, and He knows how to get you back. And, and if, it's, if, it's, if it's gossip that's gotten you in a mess, if it's lust and passion that's gotten you in a mess, if it's addiction that's gotten you in a mess, God knows how to get you into the light. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute, but hold that thought. He, David's not only delivered in regards to the Philistines, he's delivered in regard to the Amalekites. And this takes us to chapter 30. David has caused himself more problems than even he knew. He's released from this battle. God's delivered him. He leaves in the light, but he goes back to Ziklag, this Philistine town that has been given to David. And he realizes that they had left their wives and their children unprotected. And that the Amalekites have come in and they've burned down the city and they've taken their wives and their children and their stuff. Now, can you imagine, I'm just picking on the men because that's what's happened here. Can you imagine men of Cornerstone? Can you imagine that if we all, if we all went somewhere together, maybe... You followed me there because I had lied and gotten myself into a big, big mess. And I had talked you into going to help me get out of it. And you and I went together and I made things worse and worse and worse because I kept on lying and deceiving. That's a good pastor, isn't it? And then we finally come back from Denver to find that haze is burning. And to find that without fail, every single one of our wives and our children and our grandchildren had been taken on a Chinese balloon. <laughs> That's the situation that David is in. That's the situation David has gotten his men into. I didn't mean to throw that in there. It just kind of came out. Back on track. The text presents here an overwhelmed group of men. They've been raiding and killing without, without stop. They have traveled 
to go present themselves to the Philistines. By the way, the travel is a multi-day, 60-mile trip. After they've been raiding and pillaging and butchering and killing to keep David, David's lie intact, they travel 60 miles to go present themselves to the Philistines. As soon as they get there, they're rejected from there and they're sent straight back and they go back for another multi-day, 60-mile trip and now they get back to a burned down Ziklag with their wives and their children gone. Verse 4 of chapter 30 says they cried out until they couldn't cry anymore. You ever been there? That's a lonely place. And when they got through crying, they said, David, we're going to kill you. We're going to take up stones and we're going we're to kill you. Don't lose sight of that. This is the man that God says, I'm going to raise him up to be a leader and a blesser of my people. And because of his deception, they're ready to kill him. Can you hear the words of David's men? Why did you bring us here, you fool? Why didn't you trust God when he said, I will make you king and I will take care of Saul? Why are you such a liar, David? David. Why did you include us and our wives and our sons and our daughters as you dug your own grave? I want to help put you in it, David. I think we can relate to this feeling being at that point where we said it can't get any worse than this only to find out it can. What do you do in that day? Well, look at verse 6. This this is the verse of verses in this section. Look at verse 6. David was greatly distressed for the the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in Yahweh his God. That's a packed little verse. Who, Who strengthened him? David strengthened himself in in who? In Yahweh, his God. What does it mean to strengthen yourself in the Lord? I'm afraid in some in a churchy culture would get that answer wrong. I'm in distress. Things are really bad. I better go to a church service. I'm in distress. Things are really bad. I need to go to a Christian counselor. Both of those are good things. I hope you come to church today. I think most of you did. (laughs) I hope you seek good counsel, wise counsel. All of those are wonderful things, but none of them are sufficient to strengthen our hand in the Lord our God. They missed the mark of what David did. I want us to think about what David did. Number one, he looked, it's just in the wording, he looked to God as a personal God. He uses that word, Lord, all caps, Yahweh. And he specifically says, His God. Now that is a huge contrast. Even with this darkness and light with Saul and David, we see the same thing in regards to this. When Saul talked about God, remember, he didn't talk about my God. He talked about who? Samuel's God. Samuel, you must seek your God for me. Which means this, Saul had no relationship with God. He's your God, not my God. David is different. David says, it says here that he strengthened himself in his God. He has a relationship with him. Do you have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus? If you don't, I don't have anything better to say. I don't have any solutions for you. What did he do when he went to him? I think we've got a great clue in the the wording. It says that he strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Will you flip back to chapter 23? This phrase was used back there. In chapter 23, verse 16. This was another place when David was in a mess. And it says this, Then Jonathan... Saul's son arose and went to David. He was hidden in the woods. And he did what? He strengthened his hand in God. 
Jonathan strengthened David's hand in God. How did he do that? If we read on from verse 16 there, Jonathan just goes through and says, David, hey, I know it's tough right now, but do you remember what God's promised you? Do you remember what God said to you? God said this to you. God is going to make you king. God is going to fulfill his purpose in you. He's, that's what it means to strengthen his hand in God. And in chapter 30 again, David learned from Jonathan. Jonathan taught him how to strengthen himself in the Lord by remembering his promises. And now David does it for himself. You talk about iron sharpening iron. That's why we see Jonathan and David in Scripture because they sharpen each other. That is, that is the simplicity, by the way, of discipleship. We prayed about discipleship today because of this. Simplicity of discipleship is let's, let's walk together and remember God's promises together and know who God is together. And, and, and that way, when you stumble, I'm there to strengthen you. Because guess what? When I stumble, I'm going to need you there to strengthen me. There are no gurus in discipleship. Did you know that? There are no heroes. There are no great deliverance ministers who've got it all figured out. We're just together. I preach, but we're just together. I'm not a guru of discipleship. We walk together. That is the simplicity of discipleship. And listen, discipleship is a joy of every believer. And it is the call of every believer. Somebody around you needs you to teach them, even as Jonathan taught David as they grew together. And I said this earlier, but discipleship is within the capacity of every believer. You can do that. And somebody around you is desperate for it. David refocused himself on the promises of God. That's the second thing he did. He looked to God as a personal God. He refocused himself on the promises of God. And third, he used the access to God that he had. Look at verse 7 and 8. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I pursue? Shall I overtake? And God answers him and said, yes, you shall pursue and you will recover. Key word, all. David used the access to God he had. He talked to God and he listened to God. Now, I'm thinking the same thing you're thinking. Man, where can I get me one of them there ephods? <laughs> the Christian does not have Abiathar. The Christian does not have an ephod with a Urim and a Thummim in the pocket. For those of you who have been there, you know what we're talking about. But listen, the same path is still open to us though. We do have a priest. His name is Jesus. And we can go to Him. And we can seek Him. And He will be there for us. We, we, we want answers. How many of you want a little etching sketch connected to heaven where He can just write it out? That's old technology. That's your sketch, isn't it? I don't care. I'd take one. Crazy eight ball with a direct line to heaven. I'd take something. Because listen, we want information here. I need details, God. But the bottom line is people who are called to live by faith, what we need is not answers. What we need is endurance. We need this persistence of seeking Him and trusting Him and following what He does reveal to us. We need, because we have such a great high priest, we need to draw near to the throne of grace confidently, God says. That we may receive not answers, but mercy and find grace to help in times of need. I just read to you Hebrews 4.16. That's what we need. I'll take every answer He'll give me, but what I need is grace. What I need is mercy to keep enduring in faith and strength in Him. We may not get answers to our questions, but we will find grace for help. One commentator said this, I don't often need information, but endurance. I don't need to know something. I only need to stay on my feet. 
You remember in Ephesians 6, the spiritual battle? And it says there where our goal is. Our goal there is not knowledge. Our goal there is to stand. And having done all, to stand. That's our goal. We need endurance. Use your access. Use your high priest. It's part of the strengthening yourself in Yahweh, your God. We have prayer. Amen? We have, I don't have an ephod, I have the Bible. I have the living word of God. And it teaches me the principles that, look, they light each step for me. Not answers, but they light the next step for me. I have the directing Holy Spirit, who just like the providence of God, is often silent, but He's absolutely faithful. Now, David is strengthened. David is looking to his God. David is reminded of his promises and he's walking in his direction. And maybe you are in David's distress today and you can honestly say, I've been doing it without. I have been doing it without prayer, without God's word. I've been doing it without relying and dependence on the Holy Spirit of God in me. I've been doing it apart from the counsel and discipleship of other believers. Listen, what an opportunity today to turn around. What an opportunity today. God says, I invite you to come turn around. What a blessing to learn from this text that if you have a right relationship with God through faith in Jesus, there is certain Sure, hope for you. Hope even in a mess. Hope even in a mess of your own making. Now, how does this, how does this end very quickly? Verse 9, they, they go to pursue the Amalekites. Notice that 200 of the 600 of his men stay behind at the brook. They stay behind because they're exhausted. It says that they were exhausted. They weren't fearful. They weren't abandoning David. They were tired. The others go on, but they don't know where they're going. And here comes, you ready for the silent providence of God? They're, they go on their way not knowing where they're going, but they just happen to meet an Egyptian in a field. The slave just happened to get sick. His master happened to be a hard-hearted man who just said, stay, I'm not taking care of you. They... They're good to him. They treat him well. By the way, it reminded me of the passage that says, hey, be, 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 be kind in how you entertain folks. You never know when you're entertaining what? Angels. Angelos can mean a spiritual being that flies, or it can just mean a messenger of God. And here, this is an Egyptian slave. He's not an angel, but he's an angelos. He's a messenger. He tells them exactly what they need to know. Sometimes the silent providence of God just shows up in the people that you meet. And God's able to use them to be a blessing to you for guidance. Be very careful if their guidance doesn't match up to this. They're not a messenger from God. They're a messenger from hell. Be very careful who you listen to. But listen, when you have a relationship with God rooted in His Word, you know that when you see it. You recognize the one very clearly from the other. This guy just happens to get sick. They just happen to abandon him when they talk to him and they're kind to him. He knows exactly where they were going. When they caught up to the Amalekites, they just happened to be in full-on party mode. They were drinking and dancing. That's not a good uh, position from which to defend and fight. They're doing a lot of hold my beer kind of stuff. And so David and his men rout them easily. Verse 18 is amazing. Remember what God told them through the priest? You will recover all. Look at verse 18. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. Nothing of theirs was lacking, not small, not great, not son, not daughter, not spoil, not anything which they had taken. David recovered all. Again, this is David's mess, but it's God's deliverance. I'll share the warning again from last week. Does that mean you and I can go do whatever the Sam Hill we want to go do and God will bless us? No. You please reread all these stories. This has not been a blessing to David. 
This has been tormenting for David. David and his men have cried and cried and cried out with a loud voice until they had no voice with which to cry. I don't call that a blessing. What we're seeing today is not David's blessing. What we're seeing is God's deliverance and God's faithfulness. What this means in our life is it means that God's plan is settled and even mistakes, even unfaithfulnesses on our part will never undermine or shape God's plans. They may destroy me. They may cause hurt for the people around me. Great distress, but God will fulfill His purposes. Generally speaking, you know this well, but generally speaking, God allows us to reap what we sow. I can give testimony to that, both good and bad. So can you. He has let David reap here, but God says, I will fulfill my promise. David does two wonderful things here. Number one, he shares the bounty with the 200 exhausted men who stayed behind. God wants us to see that. He put that in there for this reason. That's compassion on David's part. It's also good theology on his part. In verse 23, it says there, my brethren we, brethren, we shall not do so with what the Lord has given us. David has this awareness that we didn't go out and get our junk back. God has taken care of us. God has given this, and so we give freely. Listen, if you have a hard time giving your time, if you have a hard time giving your treasure, if you have a hard time giving your abilities and, and your gifts of, of strength of who you are and what you can do, please understand that it's simply because you don't know where they came from. The Lord has given this. How can I not freely give? He shares the bounty with those two. And by the way, this is probably also a great recognition on David's part that those men are exhausted because David has been an absolute dummy. I am probably responsible for their exhaustion. I will give them a share of this boy. He also shares the bounty with Israel. I was not looking forward to reading that last section because it's like 256 names of places that you have more consonants than they should have. But it's in there for this reason, man. God delivered David from himself to the great blessing of the great territory of Israel. His people. You see, God's got promises to them too. And they're wayward and they're wicked and they're making a mess of their own and yet God's doing what? He's still providing for them. Is that your testimony, by the way? That you've walked really, really not well? And that God has not let go of you. But that He's continued to love you. And He's continued to hold you when you were pulling away. Y'all remember being the mom or the dad in the store with the kid? Pulling away, screaming. You shouldn't grab kids you don't know. I'm just joking. It was your, it was your son or your daughter, right? And they're just pulling away, screaming. And you still love them. And you're still holding them. And you're still taking care of them. Unless you left them in the store. God, God does that kindness with us key truth here David has acted like a fool when he lived in fear and faithlessness but now he has drawn near to the Lord again and he begins to act not like the devil but he begins to act like the Lord again he begins to grow in holiness again nothing changes you or me like nearness to God nothing you want addiction recovery get near to God it changes you like nothing else. You want gossip recovery? You want lust and foolishness recovery? Get near to God. Nothing changes us like nearness to God. Acts chapter 4, it says this, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter, remember Peter, he's the guy that runs around with one whole foot stuck in his mouth all the time. When they saw the boldness of Peter and of John, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, and they marveled, realizing that those two men had been with Jesus. Nothing changes us like nearness to the Lord. And there is nothing so central in David's righteousness and restoration. And there is nothing so central in being a healthy follower of Christ today. And I call us back to that one verse 6 in chapter 30 where it says, David strengthened himself in Yahweh his God. Notice the responsibility on us. God is faithful. Amen? 
And if you and I want delivered from our mess, we need to be faithful to draw near to Him. What are you doing with God? And then for a friend who's here and you say, I'm not doing anything with God because I don't know Him. And I don't know if He's willing to have anything to do with me. Understand that God's provision and protection of this David was again so that David could have a son and 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 a a daughter. Because God had said from the beginning of sin in Genesis 3, I will send a seed of woman and he will crush your enemy's head. He will crush what this enemy Satan has done in tempting you and leading you to sin. Please understand that if you are apart from God and if you've not trusted Jesus, you're apart from God. God has sent His Son for you. It's why He protects David. And Jesus has done everything that He was called to do. Jesus, the righteous, eternal Son of God, went to our cross to pay our penalty, to be buried in our tomb that isolated Him from His God. He did that for us. And in turning from my... I got it all figured out hard to trust in Jesus as my Savior and begin to follow. That is salvation. And that is available to any person in this room that is breathing. And if the person next to you is not breathing, if you'll give them a sharp blow to the the ribs, they'll start again. You can come to the Lord today. Any other thoughts or questions? What does this bring to your mind? What do you learn here that we didn't talk about? Anything you'd share with us?